think to, to try to be fair, it's hard the way things are architected now. And I don't have a good answer. Any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> the next and the final talk uh, of this workshop is by John Nalibov from CIG, who will explain the activities that CIG has done in Germany. Thanks. All right. Well, first, thanks to Morris for the introduction, and then thanks to the organizers. This talk is going to be a little bit different than the last one. And so rather than try to focus on just on CIG's activities in the three cons meeting, I'm going to try and give a broader overview of the challenges and also the resources in the larger LTT community. And so in the first, and so then I had two goals. Number one was really to talk about challenges, long-standing challenges in the technology community, and then also some solutions to them. And for that, I should acknowledge the rest of the CIG group who helped me parse down a three-hour monstrosity of challenges into something digestible in 30 minutes. And so hopefully I've done that. The second goal here was to provide resources to the surface processes community for how, if you want to learn more about tectonic modeling or even start it, I provided links throughout the talk to educational resources, different codes, key papers, computational resources like Exceed. All of that's hyperlinked in the, all of that's hyperlinked in here, and it should be downloadable somewhere after the meeting. So first, a few key words, a few key slides about CIG. The mission of CIG is, is developing and disseminating software for geophysics and related fields. This applies to a large number of scientific domains, geodynamo, mantle convection, long-term tectonic seismology. So it's much larger than, the, um, than just the tectonics community. And so there are over 33 codes at this point. The ones we use mostly for long-term tectonics include aspect and SNOC, but that's not up here. Also Gale a little bit, but not so much anymore. And the range of codes at CIG it includes codes which are entirely funded and developed by CAG on this side, and then some of them were developed independently of CIG and, and contributed to and contributed. And so then you can download any CIG code by going to geodynamics.org and there's a direct link there, or you can go to our GitHub page, um, which is github.com slash geodynamics, and then all the codes are available there. So first, for if you're in the surface processes community, if you need a starting place to learn about the computational, um, the computational techniques and methods in, the, in modeling tectonic processes, I recommend starting with one of these three books. I'd say a large portion of us learn geodynamic modeling by going through Taras Berry's book. There's also a fantastic set of free lecture notes, which are put together by Thorsten Becker and Boris Kels, and those are available for free on the web. And so then for the rest of the talk, there's Two, basically two talks I'm going to cover. One, I want to get everyone on the same page. And so I'm going to give an overview of the tectonics problem and the numerical methods. And the second part is going through the series of challenges. And it was really encouraging today 
to see that in the breakout groups, both today and yesterday, you've effectively covered all of my talk here. And so then this will be a, re um, um, a reiteration of a lot of those points, but hopefully we can go, go into a bit more detail here. So what are long-term tectonic processes in terms of the modeling space? I would define that as anything ranging from crustal deformation to lithospheric deformation to mantle convection. Effectively, what a long-term tectonic code is trying to do is model plate boundary deformation. This includes materials in the elastic, brittle and viscous domain, and in some cases, the plate boundary interior. But really the way to define this problem is to think about the spatial and temporal scales. And so when we talk about long-term tech model, long-term tectonic models and crustal deformation and lithospheric deformation mantle convection, effectively we're looking at spatial, um, spatial scales from tens of kilometers to thousands of kilometers. And the temporal scales are ranging from hundreds to thousands of years all the way up to tens of millions or hundreds of millions, or in some cases, I suppose billions of years if you're doing mantle convection. Now, you can certainly go outside of these ranges, but most of the studies you see in long-term long -term tectonics fall in this range. And so the challenge is, and we've covered this extensively in the meeting, is even though we're modeling processes on these um, temporal and spatial scales, we know there are processes outside of there, earthquake and faulting, so the seismic processes, magmatic processes, surface, of, um, surface processes that affect all of these. And so a long-standing question is, are our approximation for these processes accurate and currently standing, or if not, how do we effectively couple them? So for the basic physical approximations, you start with the conservation equations. And here I'm assuming we're starting with the viscous approximations. A number of codes will start with an elastic plastic, um, um, from an elastic plastic perspective, but the majority of codes do this from the viscous perspective. And so here are the conservation equations. The way I've written them down is for incompressible viscous flow, and so this is the Booz and Esk approximation. If you want to move towards the a compressible formulation, so something a bit more realistic, you need to include think terms like adiabatic and viscous heating and phase changes. But for the most part, if you're just thinking about lithospheric deformation, maybe upper mantle deformation, these equations for the most part suffice. The real trick is when you get into the rheology, and in most current studies are using nonlinear rheology. And so then in terms of formulating the viscous part of it, you might see this type of equation where this could apply to dislocation or diffusion creep. If n is one, you're in the diffusion creep mode. If n is greater than one, it's nonlinear and you're in the dislocation creep mode. This is related to activation volume and energy. And this is related to grain size terms. And this is a pre-exponent. Now then, if you want to include elastic effects, you might modify your viscosity to include viscoelasticity. I've put a little note here saying that if you include viscoelasticity, you actually need to modify your governing equations. And then finally, we're going to introduce brittle deformation, or all form of it, with, um, um, through a yield criterion. So what we'll do is we'll compute an effective yield stress. In this case, it's a drift or progger form of it. And the yield stress is going to depend on the pressure, or the coefficient of friction, and the cohesion. And what we'll do is if the viscous stress is going to exceed the yield stress, we reduce the viscosity back down onto the yield plane. There's various other ways of doing this, but this is the most common. And other things you might see in a nonlinear rheology, which are quite important, is you might see grain size evolution and strain weakening of both the brittle and viscous terms. So commonly what we do is we track finite strain. As that accumulates, we may weaken the friction angle or the cohesion or both in some form. So how about the numerical methods? The general procedure, and I apologize, this is grossly oversimplified. I tried to fit this into just one fourth of my slide here. <laughs> and so what you do in the tectonic, like if you're modeling a tectonic process, is, or in, for any process, is you choose a numerical method. In our case, we're normally doing this with a finite element or finite difference approximation. It allows you to rewrite your PDEs as algebraic equations, you specify for a given problem your boundary and initial conditions, and then, um, and, and then you can actually start the solving process. And so you might solve for velocity first. If you have a nonlinear rheology, you should probably be doing some, sort of, some nonlinear iterations to iterate out the nonlinearity. Then you might solve for temperature plus minus composition. And at the end of that first step, you might evect the free surface and evect tracers or whatever you're using to track your properties. And then if you want to do more than one time step, you go back to step four and keep going through this loop until you reach your final model state. So what I thought it would be useful to do is show a model result here. And so what do these models actually look like? And so in this case, this is a, um, a model from the CIG code aspect. It's a simple thermal mechanical model of continental extension. 
So I took a 300 by 100 kilometer box pulled on the sides and I initiate, and so somewhere near the center of the model beneath the moho, I put a mechanically weak seed and this allowed two conjugate faults to form. But it's important to remember, these are not faults, these are shear bands. So then these are in the brittle regime right here. And the resolution in this model is one kilometer. And so where topography is developing in the horse and Graben system, and so here's our free surface right here, what's bounding it is not a discrete fault, it's a shear zone. And the width of these shear zones is governed by the resolution. If, you're, if you take one thing away from this talk, take this away. These results are resolution dependent. The, the resolution, the thickness of our shear bands is directly dependent on the size of the grid. So then, a bit more about the software design. So what do the codes we use to model these kind of things look like? So then this ranges from a simple design to a complex design. And most of the codes I'm gonna talk about in the next slide fall in either the complex design or somewhere between the simple and complex design. The simple design might be hundreds of lines. It could be a single file, straightforward, simple assumptions, probably 2D. And you could write this in interpret language or compile language. The complex models, so then if they're paralyzed, you wanna do massive 3D problems and, and simulate a wide range of difficulty behavior, hundreds of thousands to millions of lines, multiple packages. It's built with most likely a compiled language like C or C++ or Fortran. It can, in some cases, some of these codes do use Python, for example, that is on terra firma, and it's almost always gonna use GPL. So then, if you're looking to get a sense of the variety of codes out there, I've compiled a list of codes, and I apologize if I left someone's codes out or their favorite code out of here. And so these are what I call tectonics codes, which are either actively being developed or actively used in the community. And they're divided into three groups. The first two, Abacus and Colmsol, I don't have links to them because they're commercial codes. There's a huge advantage to using commercial codes and that is well tested. The disadvantage is that it's not open source. And, the, and, and for the most part, I discourage people from using those kind of codes. But um, if, you're gonna use, if, you're, if you're set on using a commercial code, or a tectonics problem, it would probably be Abacus or console. The next group I've provided links to, and these are links to papers, and these are codes which are open source, but they're not open access yet. You might be able to ask the developers of these codes for access to them, but you can't go on the web and just pull them out. Ptot 10 3D and another of other ones might be um, open access at some point soon. The rest of them, like Aspect or Lamem or Dyna Earth Sol 2D, Terraforma Underworld 2, Sister, MVE, V2, all of these, the links here are taking you directly to their GitHub repo and you can just pull them off the web. One more point on this. If you learn to program in MATLAB or Python and you want a code you can really sink your teeth into, so go in and start modifying it, I'll note that Sister and um, MVE V2 are written in MATLAB. One is finite difference, one is finite element. And so then if you're really comfortable programming MATLAB or Python, this might not be a bad place to start out. So next on to the challenges. And at this point, I think it's useful to define verification and validation. These terms have come up a bit in the breakout sessions. These are direct quotes from, provided by William Overkamp in a, in a great report he made for um, Sandia National Lab. There's also a, C, um, a CIG webinar um, he did a few years ago. But to break these down more simply, verification is basically the process of making sure your code is doing what you intend it to do. In other words, are your algorithms working as intended? The validation part of the, from the validation part, is basically determining whether the results of your code are applicable to the real world. The verification part is a lot easier than the validation part, and I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the talk on validation. But for verification, how can you break this down? And so then how do you know your code is doing what you intended to do? Well, you can look at your numerical implications and ignore the physics altogether. If you have an equation, y is equal to x plus one, you can go inside your code and have a, and write out a print statement saying, if x is equal to one, well, y better be equal to one. That's the most simple example, but you can do all sorts of different tests to ensure that your numerical implications independent of the physics are correct. In terms of the physics implementation, the first step is to compare your code to an analytical solution. So something like a solution for a Stokes falling sphere. Most of the problems we do are highly nonlinear. And so the next thing you can do is compare your um, code for nonlinear problem to other codes. And so, then one, um, and so then we call this code replication. And so one example of this is a community effort to benchmark numerical models of brittle thrust wedges. And so then this should be required reading for everyone in this room, whoever wants to think about tectonic models again. 
if for nothing else, for the discussion on plasticity. And so in this case, they com compared, I think it was well over 10 codes, and they were also comparing to analog models as well. And so the lessons from this were fascinating. And one key takeaway from this was when it comes to plasticity, the details really matter in how you've implemented it in your code. And so the last point on verification is at CIG, we strongly, I mean, every code we have is open source and we strongly encourage best practices in code design. So what are the advantages of best practices and what are best practices? Use version control. And so here I provided links to tutorials on how to use Git through either GitHub or Bitbucket. Code review, I was gonna go to um, a discussion on the aspect page. And so code review is basically before anything gets pushed into the main repository of say the aspect code, we do a review of the code to make sure everyone, all of the maintainers are in agreement with what's being implemented. And so in this case, in this example, all we're doing is discussing how to name different solvers. And it was a lengthy discussion. But discussions like that pay off in the long run. If you make the effort to, you know, to hone in on the details from the get-go, it definitely pays off in the long run in terms of not trying to figure these things out later or address confusion. Documentation extends it. It's, it's fantastic. You can extensively document your code, and this is either in the source code, the manual through example prompts. Another advantage of open source is you're more likely to get more users. This means more testing, more contributors, sustained innovation. It also increases the bus factor. That's basically he's saying that if a number of developers leave a project, I mean, it's the number of people you could have leave a project and still keep a um, project going. It's a bit more morbid than that, but that's the general idea. <laughs> it also means you have long-term support for most features. If people are contributing to the code and contributing to the main part of the code and not just taking their own branch of it, it means those features are going to be incorporated in the long run. It also helps reproducibility and replicability. And so then if you have an open source code and you publish your parameter files for a given study, it should be fairly straightforward to download another, like the same version of the code, take someone's parameter files and reproduce their results. It also makes replicability a lot easier too because you can look in someone else's code, and see what kind of equations they're using. So then on to, on to the challenges and here's sensitivity analysis. And this has come up in the breakout groups a bit as well. So I thought it'd be useful to talk about sensitivity analysis in terms of a a fairly simple nonlinear tecton tectonic problem someone might run. And so this is a model of continental extension. Rather than having a free surface, we're gonna simulate a free surface with a sticky air layer. It's basically an isoviscous, low viscosity, low density layer. It's gonna be, and beneath that is gonna be a uniform crust of 30 kilometers thickness. It might have a nonlinear viscous flow law. And then beneath that is the mantle with a different nonlinear flow law and a different, perhaps different brittle yield criterion. And you have a geotherm characteristic of the continental lithosphere. And you're driving deformation by pulling on the sides, and then you're balancing that outflow inflow at the base. And the typical resolution you see in this model, it varies anywhere from 0.1 kilometers to 100 meters all the way up to five kilometers. I'd say most models are in the 0.1 to one kilometer range, but I have seen studies recently using higher resolution. So then the question is, in terms of sensitivity analysis, so let's say you run this model, you produce a beautiful set of conjugate shear bands. You develop topography along the crust sticky air layer. You have a nice symmetric force and drop. What parameters are going to affect your solution? And the answer is because it's nonlinear, it is absolutely everything. And so I'm, and I'm not kidding on this. And so then this is everything. And so then if this were me and I were just starting out modeling tech, like an extension problem, here's the, here's the parameters I would vary at the get go. I vary the grid resolution, particles per cell, if you're using particles to track composition, the time step size, the solver convergence settings. This is no joke. This does, make, this does have a large influence. The model geometry, lithology, initial temperature, boundary conditions, and most importantly, the rheology. There's an expression, never turn your back on the ocean. When it comes to sensitivity tests, never turn your back on this. I guarantee you. B, if you change these parameters, it's probably going to check. It's probably going to affect your conclusion. These make this. These absolutely make an enormous difference in the final outcomes, especially if you're running for tens of millions of people. So, with that said, right, sorry. The solution to this is you need to do lots of something, lots of lots of sensitivity tests, and you do them in two D as in two D as possible. It's certainly not computationally feasible to do this in 3D, but if you do do sensitivity, 
sensitivity tests, please report these in your papers. It makes your viewer's job a whole lot easier this way. If you report those in either the appendix or, or in supplementary material. So how about the challenges and then in terms of validation? And so then the challenges are gonna arise from variations in spatial and temporal scales of the problems we're dealing with, the rheological uncertainty, the pollution uniqueness, and then the comparison to natural results. So I thought I'd start by this in terms of looking at the ductile shear group. And so then if you look at observations of ductile shear group, this is a, a global compilation of at different scales, you see there's heterogeneity at scales ranging all the way from one millimeter or even smaller than that, all the way up to 200 millimeter, or all the way up to 200 meters, and sometimes even and within those scales, you see variations in composition, grain size, and certainly inferred variations in temperature. The point I'm getting at here is that our grid resolutions in these models are typically high. At most, they're normally 100 meters, typically on a kilometer scale, certainly in 3D, because we're not capturing it on any level. So our assumption that is that the rheological approximations we use and being averaged over the 100 meters, one kilometer scale is a reasonable approximation. Unclear if, that's, unclear if that's the case. And so then, in terms of what rheological flow laws we use in these models, what, what you'll typically see is something like these strength profiles right here. And so these are based on exper like experiment, um, def experimental deformation models. And so what the, it's one thing to keep in mind on these is that these experiments to drive these flow laws, they're done at extremely high strain rates. And then, then they're scaled, scaled down to geometry. This is not a criticism of these experiments, it's just the reality and the constraints in, in, which, in which they have to work with. But it's useful to keep in mind that these flow laws are scaled over very large magnitudes of strain rates. And so then when you're running these models, you also have a large choice of flow laws you can choose. Wet versus dry rheologies, different compositions, quartz, feldspar, olivine, fusion versus silication. The way to handle this is to do lots of simulations just do lots of sensitivity tests, see how these different flow laws affect your decision. And certainly your initial conditions and tectonic setting your modeling can help guide the decision. So then again, back to the original point on the previous slide is how applicable are these to the lithosphere? These are all monomineralic flow laws. We know the lithosphere is bimineralic and it's unclear what the difference is, is if these monomineralic flow laws actually approximate the strength or the flow laws that you're getting in more realistic geologic materials. And again, the length scales of heterogeneity. In the real earth, you're seeing heterogeneity and variations in strength at the outcrop scale. And if you talk to field geologists, a lot of them will say, deformation at this scale can't control the large scale features. And we don't have a solution for this yet. We haven't been able to think of it out, at least in my mind, how you can sort of couple deformation at that outcrop scale all the way up to the large scale at which we can see these features. Here's the worst one. This is the written, um, and this is the brittle rheology. And so then this has come up a few times so far. These results are highly resolution dependent. And so what happens is, so then this is an experiment either undergoing extension or compression. And so you have a little weak notch and you develop conjugate shear bands coming off of this. The angle of these shear bands and the thickness is directly dependent on the angle. The angle starts to converge once you get to high enough resolutions, but the thickness of these shear bands is always going to be relatively dependent. In these kind of problems, you see horrible, con you can often see horrible convergence behavior in the nonlinear solvers. Another factor in this is I mentioned earlier, we can typically do strain softening, and so then as finite strain accumulates, we'll weaken friction or cohesion angle. The rates and magnitudes of these are highly uncertain. In some cases, may be applicable to reduce the friction angle from 30 to 15 degrees, in some cases from 30 to 2 degrees. And we don't have a good constraint on the rates at which these things should be changing. And so then part of your sensitivity, the part of your sensitivity test probably should be to vary these to see how they affect your decision. Another whole question is, is this a reasonable approximation for seismic behavior? So typically in the lithosphere or in the brittle regime, we think of deformation as being accommodated along the seismic cycle. So this is just this is fixed flip behavior. Is this a reasonable approximation of integrated seismicity? And I think that's an open question. One solution to this is a number of groups have been putting in rate state friction models into their code. And so that may be one way to sort of bridge the gap between is our, um, is our jerker progger more cool um, mode of generating shear bands equivalent to fixed behavior 
So then I mentioned these are resolute, the, um, all of these brittle, the, all the brittle behavior is highly resolution dependent. So one solution to this is to introduce a characteristic length scale. Unfortunately, no one in geodynamics has done this. And so then this method is quite common in engineering and material science community. It's been around since the 1980s. It's commonly referred to as gradient plasticity. And so then what the results right here are showing is that in this model and what they were modeling was gravitational failure of soils and they're developing shear bands in response to that gravitational failure is regardless of the resolution of the model, they're getting a consistent thickness of their shear bands and the total offset along that line. The reason we haven't introduced this type of formulation is it's mathematically really complex and it's not clear how the formula, how this, how these kind of formulations and this kind of model would scale over to the type of models we do. Fortunately, there are a number of groups working on this. And so hopefully in the next five years, there'll be ways to introduce this type of length scale into our models that sort of get around this, to get around this resolution. Another solution to sort of the length scales of heterogeneity issue is adaptive mesh refinement. And so then this is one has been one of the bigger advancements over the last 10 years. What I'm showing here is results from um, a code called RAM. And what they did is they wanted to model global plate motion. So they input a density structure into the earth based on slab 1.0. So the model goes all the way from the surface down to the core mantle boundary. And they did a single solve to solve for what the predicted plate velocity would be. Now, in reality, what you want to do is you want high resolution near the surface and near the plate boundary. And so what they did is adaptive meshing to basically resolve these plate boundaries. And so then the resolution goes all the way up to one kilometer in these areas. It's a maximum of 50 kilometers in the deeper mantle. And so then this reduced the computational size of their model by over three orders of magnitude. So the benefits here are enormous. And there are a number of, of codes which are um, available to the community which have adaptive meshing. But there is a disadvantage to this. And the disadvantage is that if you reduce your finest grid size by, let's say, a factor of 10, you need to reduce your time step size by a factor of 10. And so then a model which took initially 1,000 time steps to run to get to your end point, may, it may now take 10,000 steps to run. So even though you're at a higher resolution, you're still going to increase, potentially increase your model total runtime by up to a factor of 10. And so then AMR has huge potential benefits, but it's not a magic bullet for every case scenario. And we can't use it with brittle behavior until we have an internal language. So then, what I thought it would be helpful to do in terms of sort of summarizing the validation issue is to critique a model. And it would be rude for me to critique someone else's model, so I'm gonna critique one of my own models. And so then, the observation I was trying to reproduce here, the geologic process was that in rift systems, what you typically see is at the beginning of extension, you have distributed normal faulting, and as extension progresses, you transition to something which is much more localized. Eventually, you're going to get to the mid-ocean ridge, which is extremely localized. And so then the way I did this is um, this is a thermal mechanical model. It's 500 by 500 kilometers and, and 100 kilometers deep. And I'm driving extension by pulling on the side in this orthogonal boundary conditions. And I was able to get distributed faulting. So what this is showing is a strain rate invariant. And the red colors are showing shear bands. And so this would be the equivalent of faulting is I seeded the middle of the model with you know, um, an initial distribution of randomized strain. And that allowed and, and that allowed the shear zones to localize on them. And so you get distributed faulting. As extension progresses at a constant rate, you start to localize. So fantastic, I reproduced some observation. Why would this not be applicable to the linear FSA? So the, my own criticisms of these models is that number one is at a fairly low resolution, 2.5 that means my shear bands are probably around five kilometers thick. Okay. There are not five kilometer thick faults at the surface of the earth. Maybe at a subduction zone, you've got like a one kilometer shear zone, but these are grossly larger than, um, um, than the ultimate shear zone. The initial conditions play a key role. I had to tinker endlessly to be able to get this to work. So it only works under a very specific set of initial finite, of initial finite strain distributions and strain rates. It's using a simple rheology. I'm just using three different flow laws. They're, mono, um, they're mono mineralic, And I'm using simplified boundary conditions. I'm pulling on the sides, but in reality, plate tectonic forces are likely driving an extension system from the earth. So the question of all this is, how do I know this is relevant to the atmospheric process? It looks relevant, but we have in no way quantified this to say, hey, it is relevant. 
And so then the answer to this is, of course, is I would need to compare this to some sort of natural observation in a quantitative manner to make sure this is actually relevant. So some examples of ways people have done the validation part in comparison to natural observation is fault population. So then this is a comparison of normal fault length versus maximum displacement. Oops. And these are, of course, time dependent properties. And these are the gray bars on natural results. And these are numerical results from a series of discrete elements. Another, another one you can compare to is topography. And in reality, it really doesn't matter what the observation is. It doesn't matter if it's fault populations or topography or geochemistry or sedimentation and erosion patterns. Going forward, because of all this uncertainty in rheology, we really need as a community to start comparing in a quantitative manner to observational data. There's no other way around it. And the best effort on this front is not only to compare to the data sets, but use them to constrain the rheology. So Boris Kaus's group, and this was work done by Tobias Bauman, Boris, and Anton Popov, is what they do is they do actually a probabilistic inversion where they run a series of models, models um, which have variable, you know, which have variations in rheology and other, um, other parameters. They compare it to observations. And so this could be topographic generation. This could be um, velocities. And they'll actually do an inversion to constrain what those real parameters are. In my opinion, this is probably the way forward for most of us. This is the best effort at validation in recent years. And yeah, I imagine this is probably the way forward for most of us. So one other copy, and so I'm, I'm almost near the end here. And so the, what the last point I wanted to talk on was computational, the issue of computational reasoning. And so then a 3D model, they're, they can be quite expensive. They're particularly expensive if you have strong variations in viscosity, which is the normal case if you're doing nonlinear models. And so the question is, how do you overcome this? Well, the answer is, and it's already there, is parallelism and a physics solver. So what I'm showing here is an example of a weak scaling result for the code aspect on Stampede 2. And what it's plotting is the wall clock time for two solves as a function of the number of cores. And the ideal case is here, this optimal line. And, and so then as the number of cores increases, you want this type of decrease in solve time. And the encouraging part of this is, and so each one of these lines represents a different resolution. And so then the encouraging thing here is we're getting all the way up to hundreds of millions, or in some cases, billion degrees of freedoms for a um, number of different codes in the community, and we're getting reasonable scale. Models on the order of hundreds of millions to up to billions of degrees of freedom, this gets you pretty far in a 3D model. This is getting you a resolution of maybe one kilometer with a higher order element and like a thousand by thousand by 100 kilometer element. So it gets you a fair bit of the way. If we want to go up to models with tens of billions of degrees of freedom or 100 billions of degrees of freedom, then it's a whole other story. And we're probably going to need a new set of new networks that can tackle that kind of problem. So in terms of resources, if you're not aware of it already, there is a, um, an NSF-funded program called Exceed. It's basically a consortium of high-performance computing centers, and it's fairly easy to get computing time on these. Generally, the process is you'll get a startup allocation, and this will give you a certain amount of CPU hours to do initial testing and scaling results, and then you write a proposal, and this will you know, can get you millions of core hours. The bigger long-term issue, I think, is actually not the computing time. It's more the storage. And so then these large 3D models are generating data sets, especially if you output frequently on the order of terabytes, the tens of terabytes, and over the long term, you know, petabytes. So the question is, where the heck are we going to store this, all this data? And how are we going to make it accessible to the community? I don't think there's any real answer to that. And my guess is NSF will have to come up with a program similar to Exceed, some sort of national facility to help us, you know, you know especially if we want to make these models available to so then just briefly on the conclusions and outlook, I'd say if there's one point to take away from here, you, there are huge challenges in validating the, the numerical models. And this is arising mostly from the uncertainty in the rheologic behavior and the scales we build with the time and space of the geologic process. Now on the positive note on this is I think if we start to couple codes between tectonics code and surface process, this is a tectonics code and a melting model, example, this is actually gonna allow us to generate new, more accurate data sets, topography, geochemistry, which we can compare to observational data. 
the downside of this is you're introducing more uncertainty and turbulence. And the question is, how do we, you know, and how do we handle that uncertainty? How do we assess uncertainty both in those two separate codes, and then how do we propagate that? Oh, we have some time. <laughs> Much for a very exciting talk. Just to make it clear, I did not bribe him to show my paper. Anyone have questions? Uh, Greg Tucker, University of Colorado. So thanks, John, for a yeah. really stimulating talk. You mentioned best practices. How do you guys educate your community or help your community appreciate the value of best practices and learn how to implement them? That's almost a question for Louise, but I would say whenever new code is donated. I mean, and so then if you go to CIG website and I linked it on here, there's a, we have a list of best practices and there's minimum best practices and then there's absolute best practices. And I believe, Louise, correct me if I'm wrong, but the policy is the codes, anything which is donated to CIG has to at least meet the minimum best practices. So the minimum best practices really are sort of minimum, right? And uh, but any code that is donated to CIG and we, that we will host has to meet those minimum best practices and we'll help people meet them. So if they don't have documentation, if they haven't really you know, adequately done version control, that kind of thing, licensing, so on, we'll help them with that. And then um, but our codes, you know, we try and move everybody up and the, the sort of three tiers, the top tier is really where we're aiming to go. and you know, it's a little bit aspirational in the sense that not every code meets it. I think one of the ways we educate people is we do have events like, you know, talks like this and so on. But also a, a key point is that the best practices were developed by the community, essentially, to, you know, as part of our broader, you know, what are we doing and how do we elevate the whole field? So the community was involved in developing them and that really helps make them uh, useful to the community. So moving from PETA to Exascale, you indicated that there are some challenges with the existing codes. And I think you also have a feeling that there are more cores in terms of memory and or this memory per core is, is an issue for some of our codes. Where do you see some of the specific challenges? Which codes do you think have the best chance of running on the next generation? And what would you do? What are, what are the problems? And this is perhaps for, every, for everybody, right? What are these things that we cannot yet do and we would want to do? Well, I mean, ideally, we want to say, I mean, we want to run high resolution 3D models at 10 meter, 100 meter resolution. Because you're capturing the scale of, I mean, I mean, that's where the heterogeneity of the scale, the scale of the code comes in. Sure, we can look at the outcrop. Do we know it adapts? <laughs> We know the heterogeneity length scale and 10 kilometers depth. At what? Oh, yeah. At 10 kilometers depth or 20 kilometers depth. No, that's a fair so point, but you can at least that. look at, I mean, I mean, you can at least go to the field and get some sense of the scale. Yeah. So, so my, my question is, so it's a full question, it's like core control as well. So we have, we have a tool and tools and tools, but you know, these last two talks have been talking about the toolboxes, but I think most of us in this room are driven by science, you know, we have science driven questions, but we're clearly not in it for the money. Um, but, uh, no, I'm, I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have some specific questions where you know, there's tech involved in, in uh, sorry, but in, in rheology, I, I took a direction away from modeling because I felt I wanted to know the lower cost badly enough and you know how it would couple to the mantle to be able to solve these problems. So how do I as a user say I have these science driven questions. I don't see aspects I don't necessarily know what aspect could allow me to do that in a way. Um, and so how do we motivate interact with the facilities like the CIG to um, to take Misfits and from first order observations and try and move them forward. 
and work with new advances in theology as well. Wow. I mean, new ways of, of, of extracting theology. We're all trying to get at it from not just the rock mechanic side, but try and find that way to work with it. So just to try and provoke some, stir the pot a bit. Well, I mean, I think there's, I mean, I mean, there's certainly a motivation to have more geological materials in the world and sort of a coupling surface process with the two-phase flow melting. But I mean, one of the points I was hoping to take away from this is before we do that, maybe we should take a step back and think independently, what are the challenges? Because there are long, I mean, the issues of plasticity and the scales of layer change, we haven't resolved it, you know, in the tectonic model. So is it worth pushing forward with more complexity if we're not necessarily doing one method particularly well or either method? I'm not saying we shouldn't, but is, is this something to consider? Um, I wanted to try to give uh, an answer to the Peter exascale question. Um, so there's no easy answer. Um, and you certainly want to involve the experts in numerical methods and computer science, et cetera. And so I think CIG uh, is, the, is on the correct way to it by building on existing tools and frameworks that are made and developed by the experts. So for example, Aspect does not implement the finite elements themselves, but builds on other libraries that, that implement them. So without concretely telling you exactly what my belief is to scale finite element software to exascale, I can go into the details if you want, but the point is just you rely on other people to do that. You build on an infrastructure of other codes that can hopefully make that step, and then you talk about the path. I guess the, the corollary to that is, I mean, one of, I would like to know, I mean, this is what my question was about. Of course, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? And, and clearly, we want to not do that ourselves, but are we making the right choices right now that will position us in a way to make use of these tools? Right? And I guess one thing that's sort of an underlying concern, and we've discussed this a number of ways, are we as a community, you know, we have great, you know, community organizations like CMS and CIG, but is that enough to allow us to really ride this wave to the next level of hardware? And do we want to do that? And, and are we setting ourselves up in the right way, right? I mean, is it, or maybe like explicit codes, you know, the way to go because they have, I don't know, smaller memory footprint or something like that. So are there any thoughts in the community right now? I mean, about that, I have no clue about this, but because, you, I mean, sure, we want to rely on packages, right? But if you build something around a package that sort of made the wrong bet, bet you know, then, then you're screwed. I do have a remark. Uh, you give a little bit, I think, maybe a negative impression on elasticity. And these benchmarks you were showing, this is the absolute worst case yes. scenario you can do. So if you start to, and also it doesn't exist on Earth, you don't have like a brittle crust with nothing on your needs that is only brittle. So on the Earth, you have like a multi layered crust, you have probably a, a viscous lower crust. It turns out if you start to include those things, the models are actually much better behaved. Except that we didn't do benchmarks yet that include those things. But and especially if you if you do viscous biologies, nonlinear viscous biologies is perfectly behaved. So they are mesh resolution independent, method independent. So that is that is one remark. The other remark is that you say you, you said that maybe it takes five years and we have this resolution uh, issue resolved. I think it might come much faster because what happened is that we invited one of the main guys uh, in computational mechanics to our European Lithosphere and Mantle Dynamics workshop last September, the worst. And that turned out to be very fruitful because he started talking with a whole bunch of different people and went in different directions. And two weeks ago at TGU, the first results came out and were shown, for example, by Thibault Buretz, uh, who seems to have resolution and mesh sensitive independent results that converge at every time step. So Great. maybe- How do you do it? Things, <laughs> yeah, that's this, we will figure out once the paper is published. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> which will happen soon, it will not take five years. So I think we, we are, by, by addressing these problems, uh, there is a way forward yep. with this. And, but I think uh, one question that I would have for you is, do you think that we as a community know which numerical method or approach is the best one to use to move forward 
or should we leave this completely open? Um, you mean between like a finite element or finite difference? Or even between different finite element calls. No, I will. I mean, if you were to ask me right now what code I would recommend if you wanted to do a large 3D simulation, I would probably list aspect in, in, in alphabetical order. Aspect, Lamem, in 3D, or Underworld. I think there are a number of codes which have similar capabilities and have similar functionality, and I think all of them will work. There's a, probably pluses and minuses to each one, but I mean, ideally, no one would want to hear this, but you know, to sort of get a handle on uncertainty, how much uncertainty your method is producing, maybe every study should use two different codes and with two different methods. But then we would need an infrastructure to make this feasible. Kind of what So I think it's super important to ask the questions you're asking and question, you know, different choices, different numerical choices. I think it might be just as important to question the first assumptions we're making, right? Describing, um, so there's the viscous flow laws, you mentioned that, but describing brittle behavior as an elastoplastic or just a plastic uh, formulation. I mean, we're, we're working, we're talking about refining the numerics within a framework that we're all using, but Maybe we should question the framework itself to some extent. In terms um, of the underlying physics? Yep. Yeah, I agree. If not, thank you very much. Thank you.